Hello to everyone. We are tuning in live from close to Germany. I'd like to welcome all of you today to our um, Lufthansa Systems Future of Aviation event series. Um, my name is Erin Beilhartz. I am an aviation consultant with Lufthansa Systems and I will be your host today. We are very proud and very excited to have over 800 registrations uh, for this event today. So we're in a very good company, all of us. And we hope that you're all able to technically tune in. This is always a bit of a, a struggle and a challenge with these big digital events, but we have a very good production team, which we'd like to thank and um, reach out to them if you have trouble getting in over uh, email for, for this event or over uh, the chat function if you're able to uh, get in video or audio troubles, just let us know. This is the second event in our Future of Aviation series and um, we have a lot more events planned, so please, please tune in and check it out on LinkedIn and follow so that you don't miss anything in the future. Today we're going to be discussing dividing the future airspace um, and then ensuring its safety. The format of today's event is that we have two panel discussions. Um, and before each panel discussion, we have um, four introductory videos where our speakers will introduce themselves, what they're passionate about, what they're working on in order to get the entire UAM industry discussion airspace um, uh, moved forward as an important topic to our uh, global connected world. So the first hour, our speakers from NASA EASA, German Ministry of Transport and um, Digital Infrastructure, and then Lilium are going to be um, showing you videos and then discussing um, how the airspace is going to be divided. How does this work? How can you visualize? How is it going to uh, function? Um, um, and um, also be set up from a, a legislature perspective so that you can kind of visualize and understand how all of these different types of aircrafts are going to um, incorporate themselves into different types of airspace uh, that we currently have. And then also the new airspace of uh, um, urban areas. So very interesting. Then in the next uh, hour, we are going to turn to our speakers from WISC, from AFWorks, which is US Air Force, uh, German Pilots Association, and then um, EASA will tune into this one as well. And then last but not least, we have our CEO from Lufthansa Systems um, to discuss together how to ensure safety within this future airspace, um, which is the most important topic uh, for making this whole thing work. I think it's the absolute, uh, absolute topic. And then we'll discuss this um, in order to get um, the public acceptance as well, which the second big, biggest topic for, um, for having the urban air uh, mobility really take off. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, please go ahead and use the question and answer um, section of your MS Live Teams meeting, and you can send in our questions. I have prepared a few questions, but you are also encouraged to send any questions to your speakers. You can send general ones or send them specifically to specific people. And I will do my best to incorporate them um, uh, during the panel discussions. You can already write them while the videos are playing, no problem. Due to data protection, the chat will not be recorded, but we will answer an, any unanswered um, questions over LinkedIn, and then you can tune in there and, um, and check. So without further ado, um, today we have our amazing group of speakers. We are honored and humbled to bring them together. Um, we are here today with the visions and the experiences of really industry pushers and drivers and leaders in urban air mobility. Um, this is such a rapidly growing industry that all of the counterparts that I have within this industry are extremely hardworking, extremely busy because this is a race against time for everybody. Um, so we value uh, your participation um, to all of our speakers, panelists. I'm talking to you directly. We value it very, very greatly because we know how uh, 
<laughs> how time is money, and especially in your case, um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of pressure to to get up in the air, get everything um, uh, safely operating and registered and everything. So um, we, I would like to introduce now the panelists for our first discussion on defining, uh, designing the airspace. So um, we have PK, the director of NASA Aeronautics Research Institute, uh, NARI, followed by David Solar. He is joining us from uh, the EVTEL department of EASA, um, head of the department and general aviation. We have today uh, Jan Dirks, who is the Unmanned Aviation Task Force at the German Ministry of uh, Transport and Digital Infrastructure. And we have Tassilo Vanna, um, the Vice President of Global Public and Regulatory Affairs at Lilium. So I would like to welcome you all uh, very, very uh, generously uh, for, for agreeing to be our esteemed speakers today and uh, thank you. After that, we are going to break into the second hour and we will have our speakers, Gary Geisen, who's the president and CEO of WISC. We have um, my CEO, Thomas Wittmann um, at Lufthansa Systems, talking about technology. We have Max Scheck, who is a longtime pilot and he's the chairman of the unmanned uh, aircraft systems at the German um, Pilots Association. We have Colonel Nate Diller, um, director at AFWorks from the US Air Force. And we have David Solar again rounding it out um, uh, from EASA. We have tried to mix Europe with America here to make a very, uh, uh, very uh, meaty transatlantic discussion because I think that there's going to be a lot of interesting differences between how the Americans and the Europeans view uh, these things. We don't have the other player, the Chinese, on this call. We had them at our last event, but this is also um, an interesting dynamic that maybe we can bring in during the questions to see um, how this dynamic uh, is going to work, who's going to be first, who's going to um, be more cautious, who's going to be more uh, uh, gutsy. I don't know. Uh, this is something we can discuss later on. Um, and then finally, I wanted to personally thank all of you for the fantastic videos that you made. Um, I know that you made these just for this session, and it was a lot of work to organize during COVID and home office and all of these kind of things. Um, so very, very big thank you to you um, alone. If it was you alone to your teams, if you had some help, um, it was really, really a great, uh, a great undertaking. So thank you so much. So. Um, let's get started with the first, uh, the first discussion and I would like to play the videos. Hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me for this Lufthansa Systems Conference. It is really exciting to be part of this conference that is envisioning the future and identify paths of getting there. Today, I'm going to discuss a future for vision where businesses, residences, and the society at large will be integrated with greener living. It is possible due to progress in aviation. That progress requires that we have quieter and greener and safer aircraft that will go faster and farther and reach every corner of the globe. Once we have different types of aircraft reaching anywhere we want, that changes the paradigm completely. You no longer have to optimize for your living or business location based on transportation access. The transportation will come to you. In order to get to that vision, we need safer, quieter and affordable aircraft and air transportation system. In my talk today, I will cover few topics that will enable us to get there. One of the first things to figure out is how to locate our vertipads and vertiports so that we can use increasingly automated or increasingly autonomous electric revolution 
and benefit that for society, for delivery of goods or services or even carrying people. Second aspect is building a completely new air transportation system, one that will scale to accommodate all types of aircraft, drones, commercial space transport, current manned aviation, balloons, unmanned aircraft systems, electric vertical takeoff and landing, and so on and so forth. Sky is literally the limit at that point but it would require a different type of air transportation system that will safely accommodate the scale that we can all benefit from. Third is the ecosystem. As the aviation grows and gets more localized and regional as well as global, we need a better supply chain system. One that will include that we have part access as we need at the local level we can do maintenance, repair and overall as needed so that the downtime of these aircraft will be smaller. In my talk, I will discuss these aspects. Obviously, there are many other angles to enable this future. But my passion is focused on enabling that future with airspace transportation system, with supply chain management support and tools for localities so that they can decide what is best for them and where these locations of vertiports and vertipads could occur. I look forward to the engaging dialogue with the participants. Thank you for your time. First of all, let me wish you all who are attending all the best in 2021. 2020 highlighted our ability to adapt quickly to significant changes in our industry. I'm sure 2021 will reinforce our resilience. As any crisis, it is also a huge opportunity to accelerate the deployment of innovations in all aviation domains, including developing new forms of mobility, which could in turn develop new markets, opportunities for our industry. EVTOL and UAM are currently emerging. This is not a new idea in itself. It has been a dream since decades. The only difference is that now, all the technological bricks are mature enough to be integrated in a meaningful product, able to offer new services to the society. Now, they are key enablers to open this new means of transportation. This is so-called public acceptance enablers. Safety, noise, environmental footprint are among the most important ones. Our travel experience shows that safety is a must for the industry to develop. Safety is linked to risk assessment. In turn, risk assessment is highly dependent on the type of operations and, of course, on the scale of these operations. Therefore, IASA has developed an innovative approach to certify UAM aircraft. IASA issued the Special Condition VTOL back in 2018 and is developing the means of compliance associated to that. The objective and the design objectives are tailored to the risk of operations. For commercial air transport operations and operation in congested environment, typically operations over cities, which are linked to air taxi businesses and large-scale operations, similar level of safety as, la as large, tra large transport airplane has been defined. On the other hand, for leisure flights, which are more general aviation type of operations, we have set up a much lower safety objectives. One other challenge to overcome was to address the large number of vehicle configurations that are currently being developed without introducing market distortion. Indeed, small aeroplane requirements are much more flexible than rotorcraft ones, for instance. This is why we have chosen to develop performance-based requirements. Performance-based requirements offer the flexibility to handle all kinds of design. This has been a wish for the industry for a long time. Now, this wish comes also with a price to pay. Development of specific, potentially non-standard means of compliance is and will remain a challenge involving early engagements between applicant and IASA. However, whatever we do on the vehicle side, we know that at the end of the day, this is the safety of the overall operation that matters for external stakeholders. Some of the current risks, such as the one associated to human factors, 
may be transferred to the aircraft, for instance, using highly automated vehicles. Some risks, especially at the beginning, will be mitigating by operational limitations, such as, for instance, flying into segregated corridors over cities. But we have to look further to enable new business to develop. The more flights and service providers we will have, the more challenging will become the risk mitigation using such operational limitations. It is where we will have to redesign the way air traffic management is done. Today, from a regulatory perspective, ATM is provided by air traffic services, ATS, in controlled airspace. Most of the time, urban airspace is a controlled airspace. It means that today, ATS are providing the services to ensure flight safety in this area. This is up to now a sovereignty of each member states. In the medium term vision, air traffic management in new space over cities, for instance, will have to be fully automated. In the use space concept, air traffic management will have to coordinate with use space service providers in a controlled airspace. It will be essential to prevent incident accidents. However, however it is today legitimate to ask the questions of the future role of ATM. Soon, use space service provider will start operations using cutting edge technologies, enabling on the long term fully autonomy and full aircraft uh, flight. It will be up to member states to clearly define the role and responsibilities of each service providers on their territories. IASA has issued a first opinion to enable use space in Europe. This is a first milestone. Some key points to address in the near future will be to define which equipage, for instance, aircraft will need to install on to enable use space services. Hopefully, it will be based on EU standards so that we can avoid redundancy and provide interoperability. This is requiring the goodwill of all stakeholders. As a conclusion, future may come sooner than we thought. But to enable it, it is requiring to overcome technical challenges, regulatory challenges, cooperation challenges, and we should make sure it is fitting our society needs. This is a lot of challenges, but I trust that working all together, we can make it on time. Thank you for listening and talk to you in the webinar. Thank you very much for the invitation to this inspiring event. Uh, my name is Jan Dirks. I'm uh, uh, working at the project group of uh, unmanned aviation uh, for, for a few mo months now. And uh, I want to provide you some information about the goals of the government and what we are doing in order to implement the European regulation. I would like to introduce at first our goals, the goals of the government. You can read them uh, in our uh, action plan, which is called Unmanned Luftfahrtsystem oder Unbemannte Luftfahrtsysteme and Innovative Luftfahrtkonzepte. Uh, because we saw the enormous potential of the drones for the world economy and realized that we have to become a leading market in the sector if we want to keep Europe's forerunner role as a leading place for high-tech engineering skills. Also, there were, uh, let's say, many scientific developments in the computers and on the paper. The industrial possibilities have by far not yet been exploited. Therefore, we need to bring the drones into the air as a new mode of transport. And in order to do so, it is necessary to get the support and the trust of the people. The drones will improve their lives and their well-being. In Europe, we have a regulatory framework which has already been prescribed uh, by the ESA. Therefore, I just want to mention the uh, regulation 218.1139, the regulation 219.945, the regulation 219.947, and the draft regulation on use base. For us, the most important is the 2019.947. So how do we apply this in Germany? We have a legislative proposal for the adoption of the national law to this regulation 947. Actually, it has been postponed 
uh, from the mid year 2020 to the year or the 1st January of 2021, but still we were not able to adapt our national legislation fully to this regulation in time. And uh, therefore, our uh, legislative proposal is still in the uh, current, or is still in the interministerial review, and uh, we are running the risk of uh, the risk of discontinuity, and uh, therefore we are really in a hurry because uh, if our government, uh, or if we are not finishing in time, we will have to wait one and a half or two year, more years. Therefore, in order to um, not to confuse the uh, federal administrations. We have uh, written a clarifying letter for the interim period so that they know which rules apply uh, at European level and which rules apply at national, national level. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, use space is for us a very, very important issue. So the question is, what is use space? The use space offers a very important service to the UAS operators bringing manned and unmanned aircraft together in a single airspace. Therefore, of course, it has many aspects of uh, safety to be observed, but it shall only be established where there is a high demand. It should not be established in rural area and therefore do not expect many of the use spaces pop up in Germany, let's say dozens of them. We think there are only a few in, let's say, agglomerate areas like Hamburg, Berlin, Munich, big cities with a lot of airports and with a lot of US traffic. So uh, we have also, as I mentioned, a draft EU space regulation at European level. And uh, we think we have two more points to discuss uh, with the EASA. The one is the question whether we are talking about integration, which is our position, or whether we are talking about separation. And the second issue is whether we need a common information service as a single source of truth in each use space. I just want to uh, give you a short glimpse of what we are currently heading for. And uh, we think this new regulation we are currently working on will uh, improve the UAS area because it will become more safe, enhance its usability for the industry and for the private operators. It will protect the environment and it will reduce the lack of confidence of the general public towards drones. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and wish you several other very interesting presentations. Thank you. Lillian was set up to make one of the oldest dreams of mankind come true. To make air mobility available to everyone at any time. My name is Tassilo Wanner. I'm leading Global Public and Regulatory Affairs with Lillian. To make our vision a reality, we are working very hard across different domains. On the engineering side, we are creating an aircraft with unheard of levels of simplicity and also safety. On the commercial side, we are creating networks of landing sites that will allow passengers to travel within a city, between cities and across whole regions on basis of the 300 kilometers range. The aircraft, by the way, is fully electric and therefore our service is fully sustainable. We are actually working very closely with regulators around the globe already. Initially, our operations will be fully in line with existing regulatory frameworks. Aircrew will be traditionally trained and onboard the aircraft. Our landing sites will be certified and approved in line with existing helicopter aerodrome standards. Over time, we will follow the crawl, walk, run approach that regulators around the globe are suggesting. Based on the data that we will be collecting, based on the flight hours that we will prove over the first few years of operations, we will step by step open the door and enter into the era of aviation of the future. This includes 
unmanned operations. This includes automated air traffic management. And we are already part of working groups that are laying out the foundation for such operations. This is all aimed to make our operations even safer. This is aimed at making our operations more frequent. And this is also aimed to make our operations less costly. Already at entry into service, we will offer our service around today's taxi pricing. But once all these levers will kick in, the pilot be taken out of the cockpit, the operation scale, we will be able to offer the service around what is today's pricing for owning and operating your own car. No matter if you live in Orlando and you take on a new job in Tampa, you don't want to move, you will be able to commute on a daily basis between the cities. No matter if you live as remote as Gütersloh, Paderborn or further remote, you want to catch a flight at Dusseldorf Airport, you will be there within half an hour, independent of traffic and at an affordable price. This is why we are confident and positive that the vision will come true, air transportation in a sustainable way, available to everyone. Thank you to all of you for the videos again. Um, Tassi, though, you mentioned um, your moving forward at Lilium with the motto crawl, walk, run. So we're going to uh, get into this. What does crawl, walk, run mean in practicality? And where are you now? Are you, are you upright yet? <laughs> thanks, Erin, for having us. And thanks for the kind introduction. And yes, obviously, um, that will be the three steps, but all of them hopefully and obviously will take place up in the air. It will be air crawling and that's maybe where we are currently in flight testing and then step by step transition into operations. What we mean and refer to by that and it's actually I think FAA and EASA who have jointly come up with that kind of approach um, based on inputs that, that Lilium and others had provided is that it will be just very humble operations to start with, right? Let's be realistic about it. Um, no one in this space, um, uh, we would assume, comes around the corner on day one with thousands and thousands of aircraft. Um, no one in this space will come um, and enter into service you know, on basis of many, many landing sites in a given city or even in a region. When we have announced uh, Rhineland in September as a possible entry into service geography, jointly with Dusseldorf Airport and Cologne International, Cologne Bonn International, um, we were thinking of a network that is maybe one or two handful of landing sites all across North Rhine's failure. Um, you may have seen yesterday, in addition to the landing sites that we have announced around Orlando and Central Florida in November, um, we made public a partnership with Ferrovial. But even that is only for a state in which 20 million people live, 10 additional landing sites that were being agreed. By that, this will be the most highly densified network um, so far known in terms of um, more than 10 landing sites in a given state, but still it is um, it is quite controllable in as much how many aircraft will be put there, how much aircrew will be needed, therefore the aircrew can be physically on board, and also it is digestible by existing systems and processes when it comes to air traffic control, as well as on an approval site for the landing site that those will be traditionally approved and certified as, as heliports, basically. So for almost all the domains that I try to as quickly as possible here in a nutshell touch on, um, the wheels don't have to be reinvented, basically, but we can basically integrate into existing 
regulatory and operational flows as much as possible um, on day one. Then obviously we'll happen a transition into a, a different era and that's maybe um, something that we can dive more deeply in throughout the conversation here. When we when we uh, walk and run, we will come back and talk to you about that then. OK, great. Um, PK, I wanted to turn over to you now. Um, obviously, Tassilo just mentioned uh, cities of 20 million being a good place to start and a lot of um, urban density. What are the other factors? Are all cities with um, urban density and um, population density suitable? Are there cities which will just not um, be first because of uh, mountains or, or winds or other issues? Can you explain that? Yeah, I know. Great, great question. We also promote crawl, walk, run, fly approach. So we had that little fly thing at the end. But basically, the idea is taking the risk based approach and ma making sure that we test out under all conditions and progressively increase the complexity and diversity of operations. So what one of the things we have characterized is something called UML, urban air mobility maturity levels. And it really is combination of the aircraft and airspace and infrastructure. Uh, as Tassi was saying, you know, it's come, it's the entire ecosystem that has to evolve. And when we talk about entire ecosystem, uh, to your question, Erin, weather is one of the biggest challenges. I mean, that's probably why they are going to Orlando first, but there are places where you can actually test this out. Um, particularly if you wanted to try out highly automated uh, operations. So there could be places like uh, between Hawaii Islands, which are 40 to 70 miles away from each other, and that flies over the ocean. So you can try with those operations till you get comfortable with the density, and then you slowly evolve into the urban areas. Or you can start with very low density or urban areas with man, <clears throat> flights, piloted operations, and then slowly evolve. So you have sort of a couple of dimensions here. You know, if you're going towards highly automated area, um, way of operating, then you try in low risk areas like Hawaii or, uh, you know, basically remote areas, or you, if you wanted to try with in the urban airspace, then you want to try with low density and piloted and then slowly increase the level of automation. So there are two different ways of going that. But uh, one one of the things that must be considered is the weather uh, and the impact of the weather at a low altitude that needs to be understood so that you know you have you know battery life, you are susceptible to the winds in different conditions and so on and so forth. So um, lots of interesting things include and then the infrastructure wise you want to have access to energy. So when you talk about the remote areas that could be sometimes challenging because you need to have grid that um, electric electric grid that supports your charging and such. So you want to have access to the energy and safety and security of basically passengers going in and out or cargo if that's what you're choosing. Some other dimension, uh, uh, some other folks are taking a third dimension which is cargo first, then people second. So there are different ways, you know, depending on your business model, you may choose in you know where to to fly and what to fly as your load will be d slightly different but there are different opportunities and i think that's what makes it very exciting in the sense that there is so many interesting combinations that you can try okay that's great thank you um i'm going to hand over to david solar now and i would like to ask you to set the stage for the audience. Um, I know that you are working on the U-Space uh, you've published. Um, we have um, a collective interest in this audience, I'm sure, to hear what is the U-Space um, and try to um, make imagery in our heads, if you will, uh, to, to explain how an urban airspace will um, be divided, how it will how it will work with regards to the different actors, the different types of actors, how they'll interact to each other, communicate with each other. If you can set that up for us. I'll try my best to do so. Um, <laughs> so uh, as mentioned uh, uh, by some of the panelists here, um, we've issued an opinion in March 2020 uh, for uh, setting up the regulatory framework of use space uh, across Europe. Um, it is currently under review by the European Commission 
and it should be uh, finalized um, around February this year. And that's a meeting to submit it to a vote to EASA committee for formal adoptions by the European Commission. Now, um, what is the big? What are the big concepts? I would say around use space. First, use space will be designated in Europe by the member states. So each state will designate where uh, a use space, uh, airspace, uh, will be uh, uh, set up. Uh, and uh, it will come on top of the current airspace classifications A, B, C, D, E, uh, F, G. Uh, by the way, we have not set up vertical limit in the use space definition, so it could be quite extended uh, in, in terms of uh, size, but also uh, height. Uh, to establish a use space, uh, which will be a, a zone uh, designated by a member state, uh, it must be supported by a risk assessment uh, that is done by the uh, uh, local authorities to authorize um, the setting up of, uh, of this. I would, I would call it bubble, uh, whether it is uh, uh, around the uh, uh, urban uh, environment, but it could be also in other environment, whatever, where we would have uh, highly uh, integrated drone operations, for instance, for very specific uh, uh, markets or, or uh, targets. Then within this use space, we will have uh, an information management where all stakeholders uh, will have to provide and share data uh, or, or on their operations. It's the so-called common information service that was also mentioned in one of the videos. And um, making sure that all information available to make uh, a safe operations within this environment are, are available to everybody. And everybody means uh, national authorities, ANSPs, but also military uh, aircraft flying in new space. Um, and that's still an area where, uh, you know, uh, there are some discussions uh, in Europe, whether we have one common information services or, or several per use space. It could be uh, uh, solutions and it's still open today how it will work um, in practice. The point is that we want to have a high quality data so that we can ensure safe operations within this environment. Uh, and obviously, uh, use space, uh, you, we will have to manage both unmanned and manned um, aircraft. And uh, for that, we have two configurations. We have two configurations. Whether the use space will be located in segregated airspace already or not. And, and uh, depending on that, uh, we will have a, a role of the uh, air traffic services, uh, which is more um, important in segregated airspace, where they will have to reconfigure dynamically uh, the traffic should a general aviation aircraft enter the airspace, for instance. Uh, for non-control airspace, then uh, it will require all aircraft which, is, which are entering this airspace to be visible by the service provider, by, by the use space service provider, and so that they can they can manage the segregations uh, or the deep conflictions of all aircraft around around the place. Um, the uh, actors of use space are the use space service provider, and they must be certified. Uh, so that's one of the uh, points either at local level or if it's pan-European services, it could be uh, at EASA level at, at um, so European levels. So, but you're talking right now about um, the use space providers, meaning the technology um, level to support all of these uh, objects flying in the use space, or you're talking about the operators themselves? No, use space provider will be indeed the uh, provider of the services to deconflict the, uh, yeah. I would say, the, the use space area. So it's uh, the equivalent of the ANSP today mm -hmm. for the airspace in each member state, but locally. Okay, so I'd like to turn over then to Jan Dirks uh, from <laughs> the German government and see how this then translates into legislation and it also translate into a local uh, countrywide legislation which is a problem in Europe with the EU and and local how is this going to work and you said that you are um, really pressed for time because otherwise the legislation will uh, get thrown out and have to be redone uh, but how are you approaching this you're on mute 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I guess yep. so. At yep. first, I uh, just want to thank you very much for organizing all that because it's a, it's an unbelievable, very good uh, meeting. And uh, what I've realized from all the films and from everything which, which we have seen already is, uh, and it makes me feel really good because uh, it's a feeling that we all have the same vision, that we all think, OK, we are working on the future. We are working on a new mode of transport. And uh, even if we have several, perhaps several different positions in, in let's say, single issues, nevertheless, we are all working there. And, and I think this is a very good precondition. Now, coming coming to your question, I mean, you're, you're talking, I think, about two different things. On the one hand, you're talking about the European regulation, which also, uh, let's say, comprises uh, the regulation uh, the basic regulation 1139 or the regulation 945 or the regulation 947 and uh, what Mr. Salah was talking about was was very interesting was uh, the question of the use space. So we are talking about two different things. When I was talking about the legislation and I would start with that, with that um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, you know that a European regulation means that we have to implement it or that at least uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's law and uh, we have no chance to change anything. But since we are a federal state, um, this sometimes makes, uh, let's put it this way, makes it a bit difficult to implement that uh, because we have to take with us all the lender and the lender uh, partly have their own legislation on that and we also have to apply all the European uh, uh, regulation stuff. And therefore, we are a bit lacking behind, which doesn't mean that there is no regulation because from the beginning of this year or from the 31st of December last year, the European regulation 947 uh, works. So actually, all the, the regulations we have over here, which have been removed by the European legislation, OK, now the European legislation counts for several areas, but there are some different areas like who is responsible about the actor structures, about the structures which uh, administration is responsible for uh, uh, implementing all that stuff. Um, that would mean that we still need to have a national law uh, covering all these uh, issues that have not been covered by the European legislation. And this is what we are currently working on. We have a draft on that, and this draft is now in the interministerial review. And uh, we are looking forward to have it in this legis legislation because it's necessary. We have our elections at, uh, in, I think, in September, in September this year, and we have to finalize it before simply because if not, we would run the risk of discontinuity. But we are looking forward to have it by then because, as I told you, we have already a draft and it's in, in, uh, in the cabinet now or it will go into the cabinet, I think, next week. And after that, we have the uh, chamber for the, for the lender, for the federal states. And after that, we have the German Bundestag, which is uh, the parliament, and we'll finish that in time. But now talking about the use space. Use space means something, in my opinion, uh, very different from that because uh, simplified use space means for us a concept where the traffic of a strongly growing, of a very strongly growing number of unmanned aircraft is made possible in the currently existing airspace structures, meaning the man manned aircraft. And uh, therefore, we are still that a bit, or we are still a bit in the discussions with the EASA and with the European Commission, because we think the basic concept of use space should be integration. Should in any case be integration, it should be that the uh, unmanned aircraft should uh, fly, let's say, in the same area where we have manned aircraft. But that, of course, and uh, Mr. Salah has said it also, like uh, also as said Mr. Copa uh, Descartes, um, that requires, of, of course, a safe, secure, manageable and interconnected space. That's not so easy. That's really difficult. And uh, so what we have over there, and this was your question, Ms. Ms. Bailarts, when you're talking about the use-based service provider, the USSP, yeah, this should be really, let's say, uh, an own entity allowing 
the U space operators to uh, uh, fly in the U spaces. But we as Germany think that it's also very, very, very important to have a common information service, to have one single source of truth. If you mm. if you have a use space where you only have one or two use space service providers, yeah, that's okay. They can they can just switch the data and they can can organize all that. But if you are talking perhaps about ten or fifteen use space service providers in one single entity, and you also you're talking about competition in between them, uh, we think it's very 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 important to have one common common uh, information service provider as one single source of truth. So just to finish that, what uh, what for us is clear, the only change we have in, in the use basis for the manned aircraft would be, yeah, it, it is necessary to have them visibility, no, to have them visible, to see them, to see uh, all participants uh, participants in, in the use space. And uh, therefore, this would require a lot of work and a lot of structures. And as I mentioned, USSPs and CIS. And uh, this would mean we don't want to have it in a rural area. We are talking about agglomerative areas. We are talking about Hamburg. We are talking about Berlin. We are talking about Munich, about cities like that. There we think there is a high demand for the US, uh, for, for the uh, unmanned aircraft systems. And, uh, and also we have a lot of manned air traffic. And here we think, yeah, U space would make sense. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. OK, I'm going to turn over to Piki now to give us the American approach on this. Um, we're very keen to hear. So I understand um, from talking to a few of your uh, fellow Americans in this area that you guys already have passed a law or the FAA has passed a law for smaller aircraft uh, to have transponders on them so that they're visible to um, you have a version of the use space which has another name that they're visible to your um, central system and that they are not necessarily um, going to be directed by the system, but they're visible to to others to prepare unmanned to see them. Can you explain how that works? Yeah. Sure. No, great question. Thank you. Erin. Uh, so what we characterize here is unmanned aircraft system traffic management. We started that particularly for small drones, 55 pound and below. 400 feet and below as a starting point. And the idea there is to scale these operations. The reason of a UTM's um, invention is to scale these operations so that we do not overload the current air traffic control system. The current air traffic control system in the United States handles 50 to 70,000 operations. Each operation is landing and takeoff. And at a time, there are five to 7,000 aircraft in the sky. And we get overloaded many times. So how do we actually scale these operations, allow the drones and future urban air mobility vehicles without overloading the air traffic control system is the question. That's why the unmanned aircraft system traffic management UTM was born. The tenets of UTM are it's a digital system. So the reason that happens today is air traffic controller has complete awareness. By digitizing, we can share that information to the operator. So the now it's a digital system, it's a cooperative system. So you, I have all the information about what's happening in the sky and I can cooperate with others. So it's a share and care type of environment. Uh, and then we, we migrated towards application protocol based interfaces. So that are standardized ways of connecting with each operator and sending information back and forth. We also use third party services and service oriented architecture so the data and the services can be provided by third parties. Uh, we agree with uh, so Ian's um, contention that it, that it needs to be truth. So what we decide is that we basically have a requirements a specification and that performance based specification is what the other parties can meet. And then movement towards management by exception. So instead of permitting every change in the you know, sort of how the current aviation works, change in the altitude or or uh, your vector. What we do is we said, tell us what not to do. Don't go here because there is search and rescue operation or don't go there because it's bad weather and everything else. Because you have all the information about all the operations in the airspace, you can decide what is the right thing to do for your business trajectory. So that's sort of the overall overarching concept of UTM and U space is very similar to that. Uh, now, in terms of your question about like where are we going, uh, the first 
is implementation of UTM in the United States. So as I said, it's a service oriented architecture. So one of the first services is the remote ID. So that's your question is we want to know who is in the sky. So that's what allows us to get that information from that remote ID. The next uh, at the same time, FA has also issued operations or people. So how do you actually manage operations or people? One of the founding things about that is to making sure that we know who is in the airspace. The, after that, I think subsequently you will have beyond visual line of sight rules, and those are going to be critical to maintain you know, this basically continuous progress towards enabling the UTM to allow these millions of aircraft and, and uh, smaller aircraft to, to get to their use cases, whether it's infrastructure inspection, ag agriculture, or supporting <clears throat> deliveries and things like that that you saw in my little video. Now, how is that important to the urban air mobility? So you can take the same concept of cooperative operation co and digitized addition of ATM, automated ATM, so to speak, and managed by exception and service oriented architecture with third party services and data providers like weather and surveillance and so forth. You can imagine that these then can set up the stage for enabling urban air mobility operations at scale. We don't need that till crawl, walk, run and fly phase occurs, but we have a path of getting to that scaled operations that we are showing a proof of concept through the small drones. So I think what's wonderful about that is we get to test and we understand how the airspace operations will work in a somewhat lower risk vehicle, which is 55 pound and below. And then as we demonstrate the proof for UTM and use space type concept. So we can then say, OK, how about the next layer up, which is these uh, EV electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, cargo or passenger carrying, and we can also include them as part of this mix. So even though we started UTM as 400 feet and below, our vision always has been to to go farther and farther. But airspace, as, as everybody said before, safety is paramount. So we had to start small in, in increments, demonstrate that it works there and then grow. We don't want to try to change everything all at once. So that's sort of the idea of how that UTM and use space characterization works. Again, I'll summarize. It's a digital, it's cooperative airspace operation. It's uh, leverages the service oriented architecture with possible third party services and it more towards management by exception that allows us to scale everything. OK, great. I have a, a question, a joint question for Jan Dirks and uh, Tassi Lovana now coming from Annika Wollermann. And she says, how do you approach the issue of social acceptance of a drone and air taxi crowded airspace? OK, this, this is actually a very interesting uh, uh, question. On the one hand, I, I want to make it make it very short because uh, we are running out of time, I guess. Um, I think uh, one of the basic issues is that we have to have regulations where people can be sure uh, that on the one hand, uh, let's say drones are not dangerous, but on the other hand, and which is for me at least as important as the first one, is the question of uh, how can drones improve our well-being? As long as we as we can make clear to the people, yes, drones are really better in some areas than other modes of transport. They are environmental friendly and don't worry about when a drone is flying across your garden or across your, your pool uh, because it will not film you and it's simply forbidden to film you. I think we can build up a lot of trust in, uh, for, for the people and uh, I'm sure that Mr. Vanna uh, uh, knows uh, many more arguments for that and, and and actually I would leave it to him. No, thanks Jan and I concur with everything you said. Maybe on top of that from, from our practical experience, um, in terms of the regulation, yes, and the good news is this is in the making already, right? When we think of the rulemaking tasks that are underway with the ASA and we are extremely grateful that we have been invited to be part of them. So everything that will basically the foundation from a regulatory perspective on drones in Europe at least is already in the making will also be out there for consultation will go through the regular um, democratic processes and Brussels institutions and then also national Im Im implementation will follow so we expect that by the time um, for example our aircraft and service 
Tassilo, you're on mute. Thank you. By the time our service would be based on a drone, which it will explicitly not be during the first years of operations, the European public and beyond will be very much familiarized actually with those um, regulatory frameworks and why they are safe. Um, when it comes to initial operations and public acceptance for the vert ports, for example, that we will be establishing in, in Florida, I would come back to what I said at the beginning. They will be established via the existing processes, for example, for establishing a heliport, and that includes en environmental surveys, and that includes certain required levels of safety and noise. And actually, obviously, we will overperform on all and overfulfill those requirements on specifically those two categories if we take into account that EASA makes us um, certify the aircraft to a 10 to the minus 9 safety level and given how quiet our operations are. So I think people, once they will see operations and, and hear them or not hear them, actually will be, um, will be impressed with that. The same also applies in terms of, you know, perspective into people's backyard and things like that to the traditional approach in terms of our operations, right? We can go up to very almost traditional flight levels, right? Cabin is not pressurized, but we can climb to 10,000 feet. And if we were to fly from Tampa to Orlando, we will significantly climb, but it is not the drone that is, you know, flying over your backyard and you will hear it or be under the impression that people are watching um, what you're doing. And then lastly, also picking up on what Jan was, was proposing, it is in the end the throughput. Given the, the capacity of the aircraft, um, multiple passengers being pulled into it, already on basis of very um, low numbers of aircraft, and, and happy to elaborate on that a bit more later, um, a very meaningful throughput can be provided. Um, and therefore, society will also more and more get used to it and understand this is something that, you know, also concerns me as a as an individual can also be part of my mobility pattern um, going forward. Um, and also here, you know, will come to fruition the, the kind of approach by which we're collecting experience, the public is collecting experience, the regulator will get more familiar with it and, and we will start then finally to, to run uh, together. I'm glad you mentioned what's in it for me, the passenger, because I am an aviation girl. All of the aviation colleagues and uh, customers and associates that I know are also watching right now. When are we able to buy a ticket on Lilium and uh, where will it be? By 2025, so um, we have been, I think, quite consistently um, communicating that for years. By 2025, the service will be established um, in an order of magnitude, which I outlined previously, not with hundreds of landing, pad, landing pads, but maybe two handful, three handful in a given region. Um, Rhineland and Florida are on track. Uh, there will be one other announcement of a third geography um, this year. With all those three regions, we have been working very, very thoroughly over the past three years. All those collaborations go back to 2018, actually in terms of exactly what we're talking about, how to integrate into the airspace, where, where and how to establish those landing sites, what is meaningful um, ODs and what is meaningful time savings that they uh, would come with, um, the pricing and, and what else not. Um, so all those three commitments are meant very seriously in as much as fleet is being reserved for those geographies, we are willing to establish MRO facilities, final assembly, facilities on the ground. We've partnered with Lufthansa Aviation Training specifically for the German cases in terms of our air crew training. So every, everything is basically on track to get delivered so that after the TC of the aircraft operations will launch in those three regions. Perfect. I'm sure you have a ton of customers on this call, so <laughs> we, will, uh, we will give the details of when the first flights are bookable. Perfect. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, with this, I'm going to um, now switch over to our other panel. I wish I could have spent a little bit more time with you, but uh, perhaps uh, we can we can hang out afterwards. And there's a ton of questions that came in, which will all be then forwarded to you. There's, I'm very sorry to the audience. There's lots and lots of questions that we didn't get to yet, but um, we will be handling those uh, in writing afterwards. Um, perfect. So I'd like to uh, turn over now to the next uh, set of speakers. So excited to welcome um, 
Gary Geisen from WISC again, Thomas Wittmann, our CEO from Lufthansa Systems. We have Max Scheck from the German Pilots Association and Colonel Nathan Diller from AFWorks US Air Force. And again, um, inviting David Solar to come over uh, from EASA into the next panel as well to uh, balance the regulatory with the uh, private and the um, American with the European transatlantic viewpoint as well. So welcome to all of our second speakers and we will play some introductory videos for you to get to know them. Hi, I'm Gary Geisen, President and CEO of West Arrow. I'm thrilled to be here today to participate in this Urban Air Mobility Conference and panel. And I want to thank Lufthansa Systems for, for organizing this. I've been fortunate to be leading this project. Uh, years and years of millions and millions and millions of miles of flight, uh, just always fascinated by aviation and, and uh, fascinated by several ton uh, things actually getting off the ground and, and flying. Um, and so it's been my honor to lead this group to deliver an all electric self-flying uh, urban air taxi. And, and so that, that is really our mission. I've been doing this for three decades, uh, have been involved in autonomous vehicles and, and energy and Internet of Things. And uh, the combination of Boeing as the aerospace leader, uh, Larry Page Gould, Kitty Hawk as you know, Silicon Valley thought pioneers and really pull our company together to deliver just amazing technology to the world. It, it, it's incredibly exciting. This project started in 2010. We're approaching 300 employees. We've got three locations around the world, uh, Atlanta, New Zealand, and the US. We fly just about every day in either New Zealand or in California. We've gone over 1,400 test flights and we're actually on our fifth generation of aircraft. And so I look forward to speaking with you today about all the exciting advance, advancements that we're working on and other things that we're seeing in the industry. And in particular, to talk about self-flying, uh, because we think uh, that is actually where the market is going and we hope and uh, plan to be the leader in that particular segment. All right, thank you very much and look forward to the panel. What does it take to shape the aviation industry of tomorrow? The imagination to go beyond the existing and the ability to bring your ideas to life. Lufthansa Systems offers airline customers an environment where they can take things from strategy to experience. We call this environment the Aviation Campus, a network of different locations, services, products and skills. It combines IT know-how, consulting experience, technology partnership, and visionary spirits. Together we create new solutions to make aviation safer, digital, and more connected. Hello, my name is Thomas Wittmann. As Lufthansa Systems, we build integrated solutions that airlines use to run their operations safely and at low cost. Urban air mobility is a fascinating topic. It will free future travelers from congestion and change the way we move within cities. And all this in a way that respects the environment. We know that UAM will present new challenges and we are ready to apply our know-how in aviation IT that we have accumulated through supporting the airline business for the last 25 years. Our product portfolio covers core areas of airlines business processes with a focus on airline operations. Today, I want to highlight especially our Lido product family. Lido supports the whole flight operation cycle on the ground and in the air. Our products ensure safe airline operation also a must for urban air mobility. We are specialized in trajectory optimization, taking into account commercial parameters as well as safety considerations. Certified and continuously updated aeronautical data is one of our key competences. We provide airlines with process navigation data 
that feed into the flight management systems of today's leading avionics manufacturers. DIDO SkyData includes worldwide standardized navigation information, such as airports, waypoints, airways, to name a few. Based on our data solutions, it's possible to define operational areas for UOV actions, including acceptable launch and landing areas. LIDO Surface Data comprises a worldwide obstacle database and a high-resolution geospatial digital elevation model. It covers over 2 million obstacles, such as towers, high antennas, and cranes all over the world. It provides the highest quality of data, especially accurate in airport vicinity, which is extremely relevant also for UAVs. Here are some examples. Using GPS positioning and the surface model to comply with altitude restrictions or geofencing en route. Identification of suitable alternates or emergency landing sites. Or avoiding terrain collision. Our products are certified according to IASA's Service Provider Certificate F1 and fulfill all relevant industry standards. Thanks to these certifications, authorization from civil aviation authorities can be accelerated, resulting in a faster go-to-market process. Our LIDO pilot solutions ease pilots' workflows and improve situational awareness. A suitable user interface is fundamental for precise navigation and for operation safety and efficiency. These experiences will also be helpful for eagle navigation, manned or unmanned. We started first projects in cooperation with UAM operators and suppliers in the area of flight planning, operations and maintenance. These collaborations are extremely exciting and we know that the results will also have a positive influence on legacy aviation. We are seeking more opportunities to support this journey of transforming the way we travel. As we all know, building technology that ensures human safety takes time and diligence. We are confident that our stable and safe products and our experience can help to jumpstart development of UAM solutions. I am really curious to hear more about the challenges and opportunities you see with our urban air mobility. I am very much looking forward to the discussion in this group. Hello, I'm very grateful for the opportunity today to present the perspective of the German Airline Pilots Association on a fascinating area of future air mobility concepts. The German Airline Pilots Association is often considered to be the union of the German airline pilots. However, while this is true, it's only half of the story. The other important pillar of the German Airline Pilots Association, Vereinigung Cockpit, or VC as we like to consider ourselves, is the Flight Safety Department. Within the Flight Safety Department, we have approximately 120 active pilots, and not just airline pilots, but also corporate and business aviation pilots, as well as helicopter pilots, who provide on a pro bono basis their time and effort to 16 working groups that concern themselves with aviation safety-related matters. One of our current projects is the Aviation Safety Concept, Safe Sky 2020. The aim of the aviation safety concept is to supplement existing safety initiatives such as ICAO's Global Aviation Safety Plan or the European Plan for Aviation Safety. We offer our perspective, our experience and our expertise to various areas of aviation safety. Within the aviation safety concept, several chapters deal directly with matters that relate to safety issues concerning future air mobility concepts. One important such safety issue is air proximity. The <clears throat> close encounters of new systems with existing airspace users. And of course, this carries the risk of mid-air collisions, which we all want to prevent. Basically, there are two ways that new systems can enter the airspace. We either segregate, divide the airspace up, or we find solutions to integrate the new systems into the existing structure. We at VC strongly favor integration. We want one airspace for all with the same rights, but also the same responsibilities. That brings me to my second point, the regulatory framework. The current rules and regulations in aviation have been developed over well over 100 years. And today we enjoy aviation as one of the safest modes of transport. 
we understand that the new systems may need new regulations or that the existing regulations are not conducive to introducing these new systems into the structures. However, we caution that there needs to be an in-depth review of the potential changes to these regulations to make sure that the reason for these changes is not just convenience, but true operational necessity. If there is true operational necessity, then yes, the regulations can be changed. However, then also a 360 review needs to be done to ensure that the new regulations do not place an undue burden on other users. So we want one regulatory framework for all. My final two points concern automation and autonomy. And I deliberately say two points because automation and autonomy are two separate concepts. We at VC believe that autonomy in its true sense is nowhere on the horizon. In fact, all the near and midterm concepts in future air mobility are automated systems. Albeit they may be highly automated, potentially even fully automated. Um, and that does not mean that these systems are not sophisticated. High levels of automation require a very high degree of sophistication. So why are we making such a big deal between autonomy and automation? Well, we believe it's important that on automated systems, a human remains in command. Now, please note, command is not the same as control. In highly automated systems, the degree of control may actually be very limited. And in a fully automated system, a human may not be, be in control at all. However, the command element, the command authority still remains. We understand this is somewhat difficult and to facilitate this, we, together with our roof organizations, the European Cockpit Association and the International Federal Airline Pilots Association, have developed a taxonomy on autonomy. And this taxonomy, we believe, helps in understanding some of the intricacies that are involved in the different levels of automation and the interplay of command and control. In summary, we at VC believe that future air mobility systems carry a lot of potential, very excited about them. We would like to see them integrated into one airspace under one regulatory framework with a human in command. Hello, I am Nathan Diller, the director of AFWORKS in the United States Air Force. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion today. I want to talk first a little bit about AFWORKS and what we are doing broadly in AFWORKS here in the Department of the Air Force. Next, I want to talk a little bit about a particular program in AFWORKS called Agility Prime and discuss a little bit the exciting future that we see in advanced air mobility. There are still some challenges for this future. I want to talk a little about how we are looking to mitigate some of those risks, and then we'll end with some opportunities potentially for partnership as we're going forward. So first, as we talk about AFWERCS, AFWERCS is this new innovation organization started in our Air Force to combine the greatest technologies in the commercial sector with our innovators across the Department of the Air Force, our airmen, our guardians, who are coming up with great ideas on how to use that commercial technology. Once we have the commercial technology then, along with the great ideas of how to use that, our next step is using this prime program approach, specifically starting with Agility Prime, to make sure that we can drive these promising technologies to the field if they have the proper utility for our service and potential savings for our taxpayers, as well as a variety of different benefits uh, with regards to safety, uh, potentially emissions, reduction of fossil fuel consumption. So that AFWORKS structure of industry, meeting our innovators and moving this technology across is really the structure that we are looking to establish. And it's what brought us here with this urban air mobility market, this advanced air mobility market, uh, potentially a rural air mobility market. And so I wanna talk a little bit about this exciting revolution in aerospace. Uh, and as we think about this technology, really to some degree this third revolution in aerospace the first revolution with uh, the first aircraft that we had with reciprocating engines wooden fabric materials and mechanical flight controls and the second revolution we had new propulsion with jet 
engines, aluminum and titanium, and new controls with hydraulic actuators. We're now in this, what is potentially this third revolution with new propulsion, electric propulsion, advanced materials and manufacturing, and highly automated, maybe eventually autonomous flight control. The benefits are vast, and that's what's so exciting. The potential of seeing huge cost savings where we are looking really to democratize air travel, making it much more accessible to so many people, making very quiet air travel with amazing new technologies and acoustics, and opening an entirely new industry for our economies around the world, creating a new manufacturing market, really to a large degree creating a new energy market as we look at a future of electric, potentially hybrid electric vehicles and really a new infrastructure market as well. Thinking about where we can have these new ports uh, where to some degree everywhere can be an airport and potentially with this autonomy and the safety that could come from autonomy, the option where almost everyone might become a pilot. So this safety is critically important to us. As we move forward though, it's not without risk. Some of the risks we see are technological risks. Uh, obviously it's new technology. How do we, with our Department of the Air Force, help reduce some of the risks to that technology. There's clearly regulatory risks. We just had over the last month, our first aircraft participating in Agility Prime's Air Race to Certification receive an airworthiness authorization from the Air Force, which now allows them to start going towards a next risk, being able to do revenue generating flights uh, with the Air Force, hopefully to reduce the financial challenges. On infrastructure, we did a ribbon cutting on one of our first charging stations for electric aircraft just last month. And we're hoping that this starts to address another risk, which is cultural. How do we get individuals to understand the potential value? And as we're doing that, we're also thinking about some of the supply chain risks, working closely with NASA uh, to identify those areas where there's supply chain risk. And then finally, with the workforce, we have invested over $30 million in our small companies, as well as our universities and research institutions to start to look at that next workforce of the future. So looking forward to the conversation, as we move into the future, we see fantastic opportunity of partnership with a new industry, with new types of players, and looking at other international partners who might be able to work with us in this exciting new aerospace revolution. Thank you for the opportunity. Great, so we're back. Thank you so much to all of the, uh, the speakers once again for preparing the videos. Um, we're back now with the panel and I'd like to just um, start off with a question that was actually uh, written for PK uh, before, but we didn't get to it, but I think it's a great start out question from Diren Majadi. Um, and I'm going to give it to David Solar and it says, in relation to remote ID, do we anticipate central computer that manages traffic or will each video, um, vehicle be required to be equipped mm -hmm. with AI decision making? And maybe which ones will be required? That's a very good question actually. And I'm not sure we are able to answer right now. Uh, probably not. Uh, actually, yes, we, the US, you, you may have seen, have, have adopted a remote ID. Uh, in the requirement uh, 947, uh, the EU requirement, actually, we are also uh, having a requirement for uh, direct remote ID, but also use space network identification, which was not uh, uh, embarked in the US, probably enabling at some point a much further integration and automation of the air traffic management uh, or the conflictions of, of um, vehicles, in, at least in Europe, in the uh, use space. Um, it will definitely require some equipage at, at, at aircraft level, but uh, which ones uh, and which ones will be centralized is um, is still a question mark, and it will highly depend on the services uh, that will be required by the use space users. And I guess we will uh, evolve and adapt uh, along the lines, depending on the number of services we will be able to provide via these new uh, kind of operations. So I'm sorry, it's a bit of a not really a straight to the point answer, but um, I think it will evolve uh, with times and with the uh, services we will provide. And it will evolve from the beginning with a lot of piloted vehicles as well. So that will help the transition. Exactly, yeah. Mm. 
All right, great. I'm going to turn over to you now, Thomas, and I wanted to ask you to, from a technological perspective, to explain to the audience how um, uh, aircraft will be able to actually optimize their flights um, for safety, their trajectories through urban areas from a technology perspective. How does this work um, to avoid uh, um, buildings and uh, maybe weather gusts that are coming up um, dynamically or other aircraft, if you can explain that. Yeah, OK, thank you. That's, that's a very good question. And um, yeah, very often um, the, the best way from A to B is not the straight line. Um, it's useful to apply uh, uh, optimization algorithms to find out the, the most optimal way, taking into account all the different kinds of constraints. So there are hard constraints like airspaces that you have to avoid or obstacles that you have to avoid. Um, there are further things that, that are soft constraints in the optimization, uh, taking into account weather, like, uh, of course, uh, the wind uh, has a an impact on the optimal trajectory. You want to avoid, uh, for instance, rain cells uh, would become a bumpy ride for the passengers. So you, uh, you want a trajectory that goes around that. And um, you can also optimize for safety by making sure that on, on each point of your trajectory, it's always uh, uh, possible for the pilot to reach an alternate landing site. So uh, these are some of the things uh, that we take into a constraint currently for um, de uh, developing trajectories for commercial aviation. And the, the problem is very much the same also for, for urban air mobility, and it would make a lot of sense to apply similar principles here. OK, great. I'm going to turn over to you, uh, Nate, now. Um, the US Air Force brought us uh, GPS uh, and other technologies. What exactly? I know that you've been uh, operating drones for a long time with a lot of precision um, from um, piloted from the ground. Uh, can you explain what technological development that you are now bringing to this, not even this discussion, but to this uh, commercialization of something that you have already been doing within your organization for a long time and also um, talk about the learnings. Sure, so I think that's a big shift in the approach that we're taking. To some degree, it's a little bit of a recognition that you know when we started GPS, it was very much something that was initiated by the Department of Defense. That was when, it, you know, at a time when we were doing the preponderance of the research and development. What we have come into is a world where that research and development is actually happening in the commercial sector. And so it's driven us to a different paradigm. It's one where we're not necessarily driving new technologies, though there are many, particularly as we start to look at autonomy, where we have actually uh, made some progress and there may be opportunities for sharing those lessons learned, you know, the early lessons learned in autonomy in remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, in the data links that are necessary to keep them uh, in the safety and the security associated. So we're not necessarily, you know, the focus is not necessarily on a technology injection by the Department of Defense in the way that we did with GPS, but rather since we have had decades of experience of bringing new things to flight, in many cases, these are new companies that may not necessarily have that experience. Since we have decades of investment in infrastructure and in personnel who have made this you know, their lifelong expertise, how can we offer those personnel that hardware in such a way that we are reducing the technological risk in doing early airworthiness ourselves, such that it reduces some of the civil certification risk uh, by, by generating some of the data, as, as others have alluded to, you know, we, we need data to, to try to start to understand this. We need the cultural acclimation to try to start to understand the use of these vehicles. And so it's more from that perspective of using our expertise, using that infrastructure so that we can share and hopefully be part of this in a constructive way while recognizing that we're not necessarily going to drive the requirement. We, we don't want to drive the requirement. We want the commercial sector to be successful, but we like to still have access to that in, in the success that it has and hopefully make it more safe, make it safer, uh, make it secure and make it, you know, be part of a very near term reality. OK, fantastic. I'm going to turn it over to you, Gary, now from WISC. Um, we talked to Lillian before another uh, similar uh, situation where, the, where they are 
really looking at um, the aircraft certification, um, the mechanics of the aircraft, getting it to fly. But I wanted to ask you, what are your plans? You are going to be an operator in the future um, as well. Is that the idea? And if so, how far are you on the road to looking at all of this stuff from a, from a future airline perspective? Future yeah, airliner. No. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we intend to be both the OEM, so the aircraft manufacturer, as well as the operator. And so this space is it's brand new. It's new technology. It will be new regulation. And so we want to provide the safe, safest experience uh, for customers as we can. And so the thought of actually building an aircraft and then handing it over to somebody and say, hey, hey, good luck. Uh, you know, there's this new urban air mobility market. Uh, go, you know, go for it. A little scary. And so so that's not our approach. And, um, you know, from a regulatory perspective, um, you know, we're heavily engaged. We we're engaged in two different areas. So uh, with the, uh, the U.S. and the FAA, of course, uh, but also New Zealand. And so we've had a multi-year relationship with the uh, regulatory authority, the CAA in New Zealand, and are looking at, uh, you know, where we are going to fly. We've got a partnership with Air New Zealand. Uh, we're discussing routes that make sense. And so, uh, you know, we're working uh, both things in parallel. And, uh, you know, I'd say when, when we would fly, uh, we're very cautious about claiming uh, a year uh, when this will happen. We will fly when we are safe. We will fly when we're certified. And I think it's um, a little risky to throw a date out there because you know no one has been certified yet uh, by FAA or EASA. And uh, you know until that happens, uh, it, it's just kind of guessing, if you will. And so you know we're doing everything we can to work with the regulatory authorities. Um, tell them, you know, we're, we're a little bit different, so we don't have a pilot in the, in the cockpit, we're self-flying. And so, you know, we're working with the community to understand how do you deal with the tech and avoid, how do you deal with airspace integration, you know, some of the things that have been discussed on this panel and previous panels uh, to be able to provide safe flight at the end of the day. Okay, fantastic. Um, Max, I'm going to turn to you now because your welcome introductory video raised a lot of topics that I'm personally very interested in. I um, uh, think I want to delve into that a little bit. So I'm going to combine it with a question from the audience. Um, will these flying taxi operations be limited to VFR only or will they eventually be flying in instrument conditions as well? So that's the audience question and then my question is if we talk about um, implementing new spaces and uh, controlled airspaces in urban areas, um, when they connect to the current airspaces that are already um, established and functioning over airports um, and things like that, uh, are all of the regulations going to have to be rewritten to ensure safety for all of the current things that are already happening? I, I'm sure it's not only new ones and they're going to be just next to the old ones. There's going to have to be a complete overhaul on all of the, um, the rules of engagement. Will there not? Uh, that actually, I guess, was probably four questions and enough okay, uh, sorry. material for a whole afternoon. But to start with uh, your last question, um, how much is going to have to be changed? Um, I don't know. I, I really, um, in the long run, probably very much is going to have to be changed. But as uh, some of my previous uh, panel members already said, we can only do this step by step. Um, and, and that's what we as, uh, as uh, VC also very strongly uh, caution that we don't get ahead of ourselves here. Um, that we try to, to take this uh, crawl, walk, run, fly approach. Um, and that directly leads me into the VFR issue. Um, for these future systems, VFR, IFR really is not a very good distinction anymore. Um, I saw some of the comments in the audience where they say, well, what do you do with the C and avoid? And um, these things are going to have to change. Uh, every player is going to have to sort of reset their mindset and, and be open towards new concepts, be it um, sense and avoid, be it electronic flight rules. You know, there's a lot of buzzwords out there. Um, but again, I think it's important 
that all the main stakeholders are involved from the get go mm -hmm. and are in a dialogue on this um, and take it slowly. Um, so in the first iteration, Lilium, I think it's good that they have pilots. I'm also very grateful, if I may enter this on, as a side note, that they have offered uh, some jobs for um, some of our flight students who are currently COVID-19, uh, caused by COVID-19, looking for jobs as test pilots. I think that's great and I think that's uh, the way to go. Uh, get everybody involved, uh, capitalize from the synergies that we get from the mutual uh, backgrounds that we have. Okay, um, I have from an Andreas. The unmanned aircraft is a huge opportunity. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, send this to you, uh, Nate. Okay, um, a huge opportunity, but could also turn a vehicle um, into a terrorist uh, mechanism. What means is the panel suggesting to control the access to U planes and technology? Cybersecurity issue, I guess, and a real security issue. Absolutely. And uh, when I was speaking a little bit earlier. You know, I think part of what we hope to bring to the overall value, you know, the, the, the value proposition that we bring should be in the experience that we've seen, as you had mentioned earlier, with our unmanned aircraft in the past. What do we do if, if these happen to be remote uh, to create the secure links that are necessary? Uh, we have begun some of the cyber uh, work to examine what, what are the potential vulnerabilities what are lessons learned from other types of weapon systems that we've had in the past to make sure that uh, we we mitigate those those vulnerabilities? You know, as as with any technology uh, from the first stone, uh, anything can many things can be turned into into a weapon. Our intent with Agility Prime is is strictly for you know logistics that we are using. Our intent is also to start to understand those structures, uh, those potential risk vectors so that you don't have some type of a nefarious actor uh, that would be able to somehow or another gain control unintentionally. Uh, and again, uh, we, we've had spent a lot of time thinking about that particular problem in the Department of Defense. Uh, we, we do it, we've had that collaboration with civil authorities in the past. We continue uh, that collaboration today in many ways uh, and, and across the entire life cycle uh, with PK here. NASA has been phenomenal as we start to think about that from a supply chain risk. Uh, as well as an investment chain risk. So throughout, uh, certainly there, there are risks. Uh, we have spent time, a lot of time thinking about that. We continue to develop those partnerships with the thought that we can find ways of accelerating safety and security to get to market sooner. Okay, great. I'm going to actually turn the same question um, over to you, Thomas, because um, you have a huge uh, system operating with lots and lots of commercial uh, airlines already using it. Um, what does the cybersecurity aspect mean uh, now that everything is um, uh, getting transferred, and, uh, going towards cl cloud computing? Um, how much of an issue is this? Um, how do you see this issue? Yeah, I think it's 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 very important to note that all autonomous systems, um, for them, cybersecurity is a very very important aspect, and it also relates to what Max commented to. Um, uh, to distinguish between automated and autonomous. Um, it's uh, to avoid terrorism. It's very important to make sure that um, the autonomy uh, to decide where to operate. The same applies not only to a uh, UAM, but also to, uh, for instance, uh, a car. Everything like this can be turned into a weapon. And um, it's very important that we are able to design systems uh, on the one hand, that are very uh, difficult to interfere with, uh, so that's primarily a cybersecurity issue, and also very deep ingrained into the operating system um, of the vehicle or aircraft, um, all the measures to avoid collisions um, have to be put in so that it's not possible from the outside to interfere with it. Okay. Um, I have, a, I think, a very nice, uh, easy question for uh, Gary here. So anonymous, um, I think eventually the technology will be rapidly embraced by the millennial and Gen Z generations as they come pre-programmed to trust technology. Therefore, I think that rapid acceptance will potentially lead to low level airspace congestion. Um, the real time interaction of vehicles from various manufacturers will be an important aspect to successful market deployment. What are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are I really look forward to having a congested airspace with urban air mobility. 
<laughs> vehicles. Um, so I, I mean, I agree that I, <clears throat> I think what the question is touching on is just social license and who will feel comfortable actually, you know, getting inside, you know, in our case, a self-flying aircraft in other cases, uh, you know, they're piloted, but it's, it's, you know, definitely new technology. And so we spent a lot of time uh, doing customer research, quantitative, qualitative, to determine those kinds of aspects. What would it take for somebody to feel safe uh, in, inside of the cockpit when there actually isn't a pilot there, but the pilot is actually on the ground and, uh, you know, gets into the whole human in the loop, but the human is actually on the ground. I, I agree uh, with the concept that uh, younger, more tech savvy people uh, will probably embrace this first. Um, those that are, you know, in, in tech or, you know, high, highly mobile types of careers will probably embrace this first that have, you know, the biggest need to get from point A to point B in, you know, 10 minutes or less. Mm -hmm. um, but the social license part of it, I mean, I, I don't know uh, if any of the other panelists have a self-driving car uh, or, you know, uh, aspects of that, but it takes a little bit of time to, you know, take hands off the wheel, if you will, and say, okay, you know, go ahead. Now, the challenge with a car versus air, uh, aviation, the variables are incredible. It's a much more challenging technical problem to do uh, self-driving cars than it is uh, self-driving aircraft. And, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, Colonel Diller and everything that's going on in the, in the DOD uh, in the U.S., um, there are autonomous big drones flying every day. And uh, so the technology works, can work. Uh, I actually don't think that is going to be the biggest challenge of actually building a self-flying thing. The tech is there, it's everything else. How does the system come together? How do you detect and avoid and prove a safety case? How do you integrate into the airspace? And then how do you get the regulators comfortable with that whole system so that they say, okay, you're, you're good to go. Okay. Um, I have a, a question for PK and I'm, I, apologies, I'm not sure if I saw this in NASA research or in DLR, but I wanted to ask you to explain it because I found it interesting. Um, the concept of the airspace will be full when all of the different actors um, have ellipsoids around them according to how maneuverable they are um, in the air and they will all have like a kind of a safety bubble around them which will then um, in a system uh, prevent them from getting too close to another uh, air, you know operator with another bubble around them and um, so can you explain this a little bit? And also, if the if the airspace is full, will they just say, okay, no more aircraft can take off now until uh, one more lands, and then there's um, uh, space in the space in the air? How does that work? Yeah. So great question. Uh, so the first item that you mentioned related to the bubble uh, that has two implications. One is your inherent trajectory uncertainty. So when you say you are at position X, what is that position and how variable that is in th three dimensions? So that's one component of that bubble. So how much is that uncertainty in your precision navigation? And I think our expert pilot Max can probably explain to you uh, in all, as well. Uh, but uh, basically there's uncertainty related to the precision navigation and operations and then there is a, a understanding of the characteristics of that vehicle. What's the turn radius? How fast it can climb? What can descend? It goes back to our early research in in 1990s and and early 2000 years about dynamic density. So what we characterize is to say how close you can pack aircraft together. Uh, without increasing the risk because they need to have maneuverability in terms of climbing up, down, right, left, slow down or speed up. And those dimensions are the ones that define your bubble and each aircraft would have its own characteristics. Now eVTOLs are interesting because they will be able to act like helicopters in some cases and act like fixed wing aircraft in others. And so you need we need to have better characterization of their uncertainties of the trajectories and how closely they can maintain those and what kind of options they have. So that will be the one that will drive your uh, uncertainty characterization and degrees of freedom you have 
in terms of maneuvering in case of a p possible conflict that your two aircraft are going to get, get too close to each other. So that's sort of the idea behind that bubble. Okay. Does perfect. that answer your question, Erin? Yeah. Yeah. And what was the second part that you asked? No, that was that was enough. That was great. Okay. Thank you, um, David. This one's for you then. Um, so, what exact? Which governing body will be um, tasked with allowing an aircraft to take off or land in um, in an urban air environment? Uh, how will that process work then? If the airspace is full, who who who's the one that does it? Uh, that that's, will be exactly the tasks of the uh, use space service provider. That they, they will be set up specifically for that to manage all uh, traffic uh, in and out uh, or within uh, this uh, urban air mobility bubble, for instance. So that's that's uh, one aspect. Uh, now, actually, that's for the practical way. But uh, after, um, you, you, we have also. Uh, to take into account the local communities and I guess uh, municipalities uh, also will have to be involved um, because it's a really uh, uh, something which is uh, uh, quite uh, um, touching people and, and we know that it's uh, sensitive. We all know that, for instance, uh, if you take helicopters operations, it's, it's sensitive uh, around cities, within cities, even more sensitive today. Uh, so uh, urban air mobility will probably be kind of the same, at least at the very beginning, depending also on the performances and the noise aspects. But for the global uh, airspace management, it will be specifically, and that's why we have uh, this uh, use space, uh, there will be the one managing based on uh, the common information service that we've mentioned, where all, um, I would say, uh, aircraft or stakeholder uh, within this airspace will have to share a set of information to ensure that it is a safe to fly. And who's responsible to design the use space of a particular city? Like whose responsibility does that fall to? Is it the mayor's office? Is it a bunch of consultants? Is it you guys? How does that so, work? Uh, first, it's, it will be the member states. But mm -hmm. obviously, as I said, it's, it's following a risk assessment methodology. And this one will have to involve all stakeholders. And, and, and you mentioned a, a few of them. Huh? the municipalities, uh, some uh, stakeholders we may not think about, uh, environmental uh, associations uh, and, and beyond to establish uh, which is the best uh, uh, use space bubble, uh, size area and, and stuff like that, but also uh, current ANSPs to integrate them into the uh, global airspace that we, have, uh, we are using today. Uh, airlines in some aspects, if, if it's close to an airport or an, air close is, an airport is within the vicinity. So it's quite a lot of people that will need to uh, cooperate together and agree together about uh, what the use space uh, will look like, actually, the local one. Okay, so I have a, a kind of a nasty question for Jan then. Um, so I live in Frankfurt. Our um, runway expansion took 12 years, I think, because of all of these stakeholders that were just mentioned by David. Um, how, how will the use spaces actually get through legislation if they would be set up uh, in order to have uh, aircraft all over cities? Okay, yeah, actually you're right. It's, it's not a very easy question. No. Especially because, uh, <laughs> especially because we are just at the beginning. And this is what I also wanted to mention over here, that uh, the use space is not yet in place. Therefore, uh, we need to have a lot of research on that. And we need, of course, and this is, David, I'm, I'm really thankful for that, uh, what you're saying. Of course, it's not only the government who defines the use spaces, but it's a whole bunch of people. And, and these are a lot of, of people who are all working on the use basis. If you have a really crowded area like in Frankfurt, where you have another runway and where you have a lot of uh, manned aircraft, actually, yeah, it would be very difficult to install the use space across the whole city. But nevertheless, of course, even if you're a very crowded city and even if, if there's a lot of airplanes flying around, uh, you will have areas where on the one hand you have a very, very strong demand for uh, uh, for UAS services or for USSPs and uh, where you also have uh, uh, enough space 
to uh, yeah, exploit the possibilities of the of the uh, drones. And uh, what uh, Max has said, I think was was actually it was very interesting. It's it's especially the point we have to integrate that. So if we realize that there are uh, advantages, a lot of advantages, economic advantages, advantages for the people uh, by exploiting, let's say, drones instead of airplanes, then it would make a lot of sense to integrate all that into one new space and to carry out, uh, let's say, a lot of safety and security measures in order to prevent them from, from colliding. But nevertheless, I don't think that the question itself would be a, a black or white saying, OK, uh, Frankfurt is so crowded, there is no chance to have uh, uh, use space. Uh, neither would it be just we have only use space and the manned aircraft has to has to go away for it. Of course not. It would always be the case that the manned aircraft, uh, that, that the unmanned aircraft would uh, be the ones who uh, uh, have to take uh, activities if, um, let's say, a manned airplane or if an emergency uh, airplane or whatever, an emergency helicopter or whatever happens, uh, of course they will go down. And this is the role of uh, what David has said of the use space service provider. The use space service provider has to tell the, the operator, they have to tell the operator, OK, it's safe to fly over here. Or they have, if there's really an emergency or if there's really coming a manned airplane, they have to tell them, sorry, guys, you have to go down or you have to leave your corridor because in a few minutes or in a few seconds, there will be uh, another airplane. This, uh, this has to be organized and actually it's not uh, we are, we are planning as a government, last sentence, we are planning as a government to install a use space demonstrator in order to understand the relations in between all these actors, in order to understand what structures we need and in order to understand what technical equipment we, meet, we need in order to integrate the unmanned aircraft in the existing uh, structures of man manned aircraft. Thank you. Okay. Um we are getting closer to the end, so I'd like to um, ask you guys, I'm going to do it in order of who I can see on my screen for a last thought. Uh, David, over to you. Yeah, so um, really, I think we are we are in a very exciting phase of aviation. Um, so that that's very much where all the technology bricks are, are maturing enough to, to enable a new uh, maybe a revolution, as, as it was mentioned by, by Nathan a bit earlier on, the third one potentially. Uh, and he, I guess it's, it may be also accelerated by the current crisis, where actually uh, we may see uh, the opportunities to have a lot of investments. Uh, but also, um, uh, you know, we were coming from a very crowded airspace to a much less. So where maybe the first introductions could be a bit easier and, and less friction with the overall aviation system could enable uh, at some point uh, earlier introductions of these kind of services within the, the population. And that's my uh, final question. We need to make sure that we are really tackling the needs of the people. Otherwise, it, it is just an engineering um, fancy stuff. Uh, and, and that's probably one of the biggest challenge. Understand what people are willing um, not only to pay, but to uh, take as a transportation mean in the future. That's very uh, uh, key questions, uh, I hope. Uh, we will have uh, uh, some answers, uh, tangible ones, with some uh, early uh, uh, tests in real uh, operations uh, very soon. Jan, last thoughts. OK, yes, uh, actually, uh, what I think is uh, we are currently living in a time where we have the opportunity to install a new mode of transport and to bring it to bring it into life. And uh, actually, these are very, very challenging issues. These are very challenging times, but nevertheless, um, these are brilliant and very nice times. And I think uh, we can all be very happy to live in these times. And finally, I would say, as what I've said at at the beginning, I'm really glad and I'm really happy to that we all have the same goals that we all think, OK, future, it's possible to build the future. And uh, so I think we should work closely together in events like that. And actually, I want to thank you again for what you've done over here. It was a very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Um, yeah, two thoughts. First of all, um, 
just because I, I cannot let that stand when Gary says that um, cars are much easier to automate than aircraft. I, I think that's wrong. Um, it's not true. Um, if you look at just the platform to design a car that can drive by itself is very simple. What the challenges are to integrate into the existing system. The same is true for aircraft. And I think that the challenges for aircraft are much bigger because what we're looking at in the future with the congested airspace that we're going to get to integrate these systems, it's going to be extremely complicated. So that and also I'm not aware of any autonomous system currently flying in the sky, not even with the Air Force, not in the true sense of autonomy. Um, and on that note, I, I think it is important, not just because I'm a pilot, but because also for societal questions, to keep the human in the loop, to keep the human involved and to develop systems that find the optimum human machine interface. Because I think that the human, be it a pilot, be it an operator, be it a controller, dispatcher, systems engineer, whatever, as long as they are part of the system, they can add significant value to the system. And that's going to be true for a long time, probably if you get philosophical forever. Plus there's insurance that we haven't discussed, so we can bring that, uh, we can we can discuss that in the next panel, but so um, Gary, go ahead. So let, let me add Max a little bit here. So I think, I think you have to separate that my point was a technical point, not a regulatory point. And if you separate those two things, so technically to do a self-driving car, it's harder it's much easier from a regulatory perspective. And so I think from a technology perspective, we're flying uh, uh, autonomous things now. Uh, there's a lot of autonomy in just every commercial flight that, that we get on. And so my, my point is, technically it will be easier to solve. It is much more challenging to build an entire system, uh, to get the regula regulatory authorities to be able to, you know, certify and certify these things as safe. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not underestimating the challenge there. It, it will be a big challenge. Um, but, you know, having said that, we're at the forefront, and I think it echoes some of the other panelists' comments of fundamentally changing transportation. And, you know, if, if we are successful and we can turn this into everyday kind of transportation, so you don't have to go to an airport, you don't have to wait in a queue, you know, and all of that. And it's just like a, a simple point A to point B, 10 minute flight, 15 minute flight. We will be improving people's lives. And it's it's a, an incredibly exciting time. We're at the forefront of this. There's a heck of a lot of hard work to go. And I would echo also that I think cooperation in this area will be absolutely key. Um, working all the vendors uh, working together. Uh, you know, I, I don't view other people that are doing UAM as competitors per se. This is a market that we're building together, and I think we need to cooperate uh, a lot more as it relates to airspace integration and, and regulation, those kinds of things. I think it's very important. Nathan Diller. Certainly uh, would, would echo those comments. Uh, the, to me, the, the cornerstone of this is partnership. We're, we're all on this adventure trying to understand is there truly value here? And I think I think the the way of learning quickly, the way of extracting that value, you know, as I mentioned earlier, for us in the Air Force, we're taking a radically different approach, in, in that we're not we're not writing requirements, we're not asking industry to go develop something specifically. We've taken, you know, we've put thirty eight million dollars into research institutions, universities to see what are the technologies that are out there. I, th I think I think that openness uh, to establish those partnerships. And then the next is, how do we proceed down the various risks that are out there in simultaneity to some degree? The technical risks are obvious. Uh, how do we start to, to whittle away on the challenges of the regulatory risks? Clearly the financial risk, can we get a few of these doing a mission that we know is effective in the near term? The cultural risks, again, that partnership, how do we bring different people to, to start, a, uh, you know, and these are partnerships we're creating with some of the municipalities, how do you bring people together to see this is this is actually happening now? Uh, this is very quiet and it's fine uh, vertically. So it's, that's phenomenal to be able to see that uh, with the infrastructure. We did a ribbon cutting on the first uh, electric charging station back in December. Uh, so I think simultaneously moving in in little incremental steps together uh, is going to be the key to do this uh, and, and being able to learn quickly 
because the, the potential there is absolutely phenomenal for what it can do from a savings perspective, improving lives around the world. Thank you. Tassilo. It will be a joint undertaking, um, which will be successful, but to make it successful, uh, we absolutely have to work very, very closely together as an industry and beyond as an ecosystem. Um, so let's team up. Let's crawl together. Let's walk together. and Let's run together. As a father of three, if I may say, I know that the transition from one phase to the next can go faster than expected, and that should be our hope as a team here. Thanks for the great session. Thank you. Thomas? Yeah, uh, it's indeed exciting times, and we, we tend to see these exciting new aircraft uh, uh, like uh, uh, Lilium uh, or Whisk. It's now the time where the invisible parts uh, very much come into play. So the digital fabric that uh, orchestrates uh, the flights uh, between all the operators, um, uh, kind of automated air traffic control. And I think there are still a lot of challenges ahead um, and we will have to take some step by step and we, we have to grow our control systems around it. I think it's fair to say also in commercial aviation, we are far away from automated air traffic control and we will need something like that um, if we operate such systems uh, at large scale. And I hope it, it also reflects back on, on commercial aviation as we know it today. Thank you. So PK, um, I steal your last thoughts and I ask you one final question. Will sure. it have been more difficult to get um, unmanned tr uh, the taxis flying people around urban airspaces or to have put a man on the moon? Oh, great question. Uh, they're equally exciting. Let me just say uh, the difficulty is in the uh, eyes of the beholder. I think the excitement and the passion is what makes things happen. So if you're passionate and we are energized and we collaborate, collaborative innovation, anything is possible. Great. I want to say an unbelievably big thank you to all of you for spending your time with us and our viewers today. Um, this will all be available on LinkedIn, minus the little technical difficulties that we have had, and those will be cut out. Um, but I would like you to look here if you want to join us for um, the next events. We have uh, guaranteed such a variety of speakers as today, um, focusing on things like operation and vendor setup, which uh, some of you on this call mentioned today as being absolutely key. We had also questions about production and how this is all going to work. Then digital maintenance, predictive maintenance, um, different areas where we need to do maintenance, decentralized complete maintenance um, uh, concept, which is completely different to what we have in a normal aviation, classic aviation, then a commercial discussion. How is this going to make money and when? and then the sustainability topic. And maybe we'll add some more as well. So please um, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we will answer the questions that we didn't get to. Um, and otherwise, I wish you a great day. Thank you.